Hello and welcome to this first look exploring session looking at Hippolytus by Seneca, uh, translated into English by John Studley around 1567, one of the 10 tragedies of Seneca that uh, are uh, published uh, and uh, later reprinted as the 10 tragedies um, in uh, 1581. Uh, this is our penultimate Seneca tragedy. Um, we, we, we have this and one more to do. Um, hopefully will be accurate in terms of the order of these videos being released. Um, and yes, we have reached Hippolytus, another cheerful cheerful tale of cheerful folk being cheerful. Um, we don't have a lot of time stopping and starting, but we will occasionally pause and to give people an in-breath um, <laughs> from the, the happiness that's ensuing. So reading today, the part of Hippolytus himself is... Hello, hello. My name is Simon Nader and I'm a British actor and director living in Dublin. Uh, and it's worth noting, it's Steve McQueen's birthday today, which is as far away from Hippolytus as you can get. Enjoy. Indeed. Uh, reading uh, Phaedra today is... Brian e. Sparrow, actor in Lincolnshire. Uh, reading uh, Nuntius and Nutrix today is... Hello, I'm Lynn Freitas. I'm a teacher. I'm currently in California, USA. Uh, sharing the chorus as well as reading Theseus is... Alan Scott, based in Suffolk. And I'm your host, Robert Crichton. I will take over the cudgels of the chorus when uh, when everybody's on stage. Uh, so I will also vaguely occasionally read uh, stage directions. Uh, there aren't any stage directions. I'll remind you what act it is every so often. Uh, so without further ado, we're going to dive into Act 1, Scene 1. And Hippolytus is on stage. Go, range about the shady woods, beset on every side with nets, with hounds and toils, and running out at random ride about, about the craggy crests of high Secrips Hill, with speedy foot around the, about the rocks, with coursing wander still, that under carpenitous soil in dale below doth lurk, whereas the rivers running swift their flapping waves do work and dash against the beaten banks of Thrias Valley low and clamber up the slimy clues besmeared with hoary snow that falleth when ye western wind from ripe mounts doth blow. Here, here away, let other wend, whereas with lofty head the elm displays his branched arms, the wood to overspread. Whereas the meadows green do lie, where Zephyrus most mild outbraze his balmy breath so sweet to garnish up the field with lusty springtide flowers fresh. Whereas Elysius slow doth fleet upon the icy flakes and on the pastures low. Meander sheds his straggling stream and shears the fruitless sand with rackful wave. Ye whom the path on Marathon's left hand doth lead unto the leavened lands, whereas the herd of beast for evening forage go to graze and stalk unto their rest. The rascal deer trip after fast. You thither take your way, where clotted hard Arcanian forced warm southern winds to obey doth slake the chilling cold into hymatus icy clive cliff to uh, alfred's little villages now let some other drive that plot where sunion surges high do beat the sandy banks whereas the marble sea doth fleet with crooked compassed cranks unhaunted lies too long without an race of any white who set a gog with hunting brave in woods doth take delight. Philippus him allures, her haunts a foamy bristled boar that doth annoy with ghastly dread the husbandman full sore. We know him well, for he it is foiled with so many wounds, but ere they do begin to ope, let slip, let slip your hounds. But in your leashes, sirs, keep up your eager mastiffs yet. Keep on their collars still, that do their galled necks ye fret. The Spartan dogs, eager of prey and of courageous kind, that some can, that soon can single out their game, whereto they be assigned. Tie shorter up within your leash. To past time shall it bring, that with the yelping noise of hounds the hollow rock shall ring. Now let the hounds go find of it with nostril good of scent and trace unto the ugly den ere dawning day be spent while in the dewish stabby ground the prick of cleese doth stick. 
One bear the toil on cumbered neck, and some with nets full thick make speed. Some with the arming cored by pencil painted red, by slight and subtle guileful fear shall make the beasts a dread. Look thou to pitch thy thirling dart, and thou to try thy might, shall cope him with broad boar spear, with hand both left and right. Thou, standing at receipt, shall chase the rounded beasts amain, with hallowing thou with limer, <laughs> limber, sharp, undo him being slain. Grant good success unto thy mate, Virago, thou divine, that secret deserts chosen hast for noble empire thine whose thurlid deserts chosen hast for noble empire thine whose sorry, thurlid darts with level right do gore the beast with blood that laps the lukewarm liquor of rex's fleeting flood and eke the beast that sports itself on frozen lister strand the ramping lions eke of gate are chased by thy hand, and eke the windy heeled heart in candle thou dost chase. Now with more gentle lance thou strikes the doe that trips apace. To thee the tiger fierce, his diverse spotted breast dost yield. The rough shagery bugle turns on thee his back in field, eke savage buffs Oofs, with branch and horns, all things thy quarrels fear, that to thy needy Garamus in Afric doth appear, or else the wild Arabian enriched by his wood, or what the brutish rocks of Pyrene uh, understood, or else what other beasts do lurk in wild Hercanus grove, or else among Sarmatians in desert fields that rove, if that the ploughman come to field that standeth in thy grace into his nests, his nets, the roused beast, full sure he is to chase. No feet in sunder break the cords, and home he brings the boar in toting wane, when as the hounds with gubs of clotted gore besmeared have their grimed, grimed snouts, and then the country rout to cottages repair in ranks with triumph all about. Lo, goddess, grant us grace. The hounds already opened have. I follow must the chase, this gainer away my pains to save. I take into the woods. And Act 1, Scene 2, focus shifts to Phaedra and Nutrix. O oh, country Crete, that bears the sway upon the seas so vast, whose ships so thick in every shore the seas do overcast, whatever coast as far as is Assyria land doth lie, where Nereus doth the pike stem to cut his course deny, why force ye me that yielded am a pledge to those I hate, and given in bridal bed to be my enemy's spousal mate, to languish out my time in tears in woe to lead my life. My husband lo and renegate is gone from me his wife, yet Theseus still performs his oh the alike unto his spouse, as erst to, Ed to Ariadne when he falsified his vows. He champion stout dare enterprise the darkness deep to pass, of loathsome lake, whence yet found out, no way returning was. A soldier of the wooer bold, proserpine home to bring, out pulled perforce from grisly throne of dire infernal king. Accompanied with fury fierce, he marcheth forward still, whom neither dread nor shame could force, forbear his wicked will. With lawless wedlock's ravishments, Hippolytus his sire, doth in the boiling bottom deep of Acheron require. But yet another great, greater grief sways on my pensive breast. No silent night nor slumber deep can set my heart at rest. My sorrow still is nourished and still, it, and still increaseth it, and rankless in my boiling breast as out of Etna's pit. The stifling vapour upward sties and palace web it stands. At rest my dropping distaff down doth drop between my hands. My luskish mind, it hath no lust, my vowed gift to pay unto the temples of the gods that loo my Theseus may, nor rigging with the Athenian dames among the altars proud to toss the fiery brands unto the sacrifice allowed, nor yet devoutly praying at the Ares with 
godly car is to palace president in air to offer sacrifice it doth delight me to pursue the chased beasts in flight and toss my flashing falcon fierce with nimble hand full light what ails thou mind this mad to take concept in freight and fell my wretched mother's fatal vice a breeding now i smell to cloak our crime our lust our lust doth know woods are the fittest place alas good mother i lament the heavy luckless case thou rash attaint with loathsome lust enamoured is thy breast even with the cruel head of all the herd of salvage beast that churlish angry roaring bull no yoke can be sustain and he among the wild and eke untamed meat doth reign yet was inclined to love what god can grant me my desire or daedalus with curious craft can ease my flaming fire not if he might return whom ariadne hath instruct from crooked compassed labyrinth by thread that out he plucked among the lurking corners close and wily winding way to grope his footing back again and did deprive of day our monstrous minotaur enclosed in maze and dungeon blind although he promised to our saw no salve yet can he find through me apollo's progeny doth venus quite again the filthy shame that she and mars together did sustain whom phoebus taking at their task all naked in the sky hung up in nets a laughing stock to every gazing eye for this all phoebus stock with vile and foul reproach she stains in some of minos family still loathsome lusting reigns one mischief brings another in O oh, Theseus, wife and child of Jove, let vice so soon, let vice be soon out of thine honest breast exiled, and quenched raging heat to dire despair do not upyield, who at the first replenish repulseth love, is safe and wins the field. Who doth by flattering fancy fawn feed on his vicious vein, too late doth grudge against the yoke which erst he did sustain. Nor yet do I forget how hard and void of reason clean a prince's stately stomach yields unto the golden mean. That end I will accept, whereto by fortune I can lead, the neighbor's wheel great comfort brings unto the hoary head. The first wit redress is to withstand, not willingly to slide, the second is to have the fault by mean and measure tried. O oh, wicked wretch, what wilt thou do? Why dost thou burden more the sustained, the stained rock, and dost excel thy mother's fault afore? Most heinous is thy guilt, then yet thy mother's what thy my mother's monster was. For monsters mayst thou think are brought by destiny to pass. But let the cause of sin to blame of manners lewd redound. And if because thy husband doth not breathe above the ground, thou thinks thou mayest defend thy fault and make thy matter good and free from fear? Art thou beguiled? Yet think the Stygian flood in grisly gaping gulf, for I hath drenched Theseus deep, but yet thy sire, whose kingdoms large the sea at will do keep, whose dreadful doom pronounceth pangs and do deserved pain. Two hundredth wailing souls at once. Will he, thinks thou, maintain so heinous crime to couch? To care the care of tender parents' breast, full wise and wary is to bring their children to the best. Yet shall we think by subtle mean, by craft and devilish guile, in hugger mugger close to keep our treachery so vile? What shall thy mother's father, Phoebe, whose beams so blazing bright with fiery gleam on everything doth shed his golden light? Or Jove, the grandsire great of gods that all the world doth shape and brandisheth, brandisheth the flaming fist, his fiery lightning flake. That Vulcan doth in furnace hot of dusky Etna make, thinks thou this may be brought to pass so heinous crime to hide among thy grandsire all that hath each privy thing espied. But though in favor of the gods conceal a second time, 
thy loathsome lust, unworthy name, unto thy body crime, sure faithfulness and nexed be that ever barred was. Each great offense, what will this work? A present plague, alas. Suspicionless, the guilty might bewray thy deed unjust, and conscience burdened sore with sin that doth itself mistrust. Some have commit offense full safe from any bitter blame, but none without the stinging pricks of conscience did the same. Assuage the boiling flames of this thy lewd, ungracious love, such monstrous mischief horrible from modest mind remove, which never did barbarian commit unto this day. No, not the gadding goths that up and down the fields do stray, nor craggy crested Taurus mount whose hoary and frosted face with numbing cold abandons all inhabitants in the place. Nor yet the scattered Scythian, thy mother, have in mind. But the father's wedlock with the sons thou seekest to be. Oh, and fear this foreign venery so strange against thy kind. The father's wedlock with the sons thou seekst to be defiled and to conceive in wicked womb a bastard mongrel child. Go to and turn thy nature to the flame of burning breast. Why yet do monsters cease? Why is thy brother's cave in rest? Without an other greedy fiend to munch up flesh of men, misshapen loathly monsters born so oft the world shall bear, so oft rebels against herself, confused nature dear, as love entangles nymphs of Crete. I know the truth you teach, O oh nurse, but fury forceth me at worser things to reach. My mind even wittingly to vice falls forward prone and bent, to wholesome counsel back again, in vain it doth relent. As when the Norman tugs and toils to bring the freighted bark against the striving stream, in vain he loseth all his cark, and down the shallow stream perforce the ship doth headlong yield, where reason preaseth forth, their fighting fury wins the field, and bears the swinging sway, and crank Cupido's puissant might, triumphant, triumpheth over all my breast, this flighty winged wight, and puissant potestate, Throughout the world doth hear the stroke, and with unquenched flames doth force Jove kindled breast to smoke. The battle-beaten Mars hath felt these bitter burning brands, and eke the god hath tasted the, the, these, whose fervent fiery hands. The thumping thunder, bouncing bowls, three forked wise doth frame, and he that ever busted is about the furious flame. In smoultering furnace, raging hot on dusky top so high of foggy etna mount and with such slender heat doth fry and phoebe himself that wields his dart upon his twanging string with aimed shaft directly driven the wimpled lad doth sting with power he scours along the earth and marble sky amain lust favouring folly filthily did falsely forge and feign love for a god and that he might his freedom more attain, ascribes the name of feigned god to shittle bedlam rage. Erisina about the world doth send her roving page, who gliding through the azure skies with slender jointed arm, his perilous weapons wields at will and working grievous harm. Of bones and stature, being least great, might he doth display upon the gods, compelling them to crouch him, to crouch and him obey. Some brain-sick head did attribute these things unto himself, and Venus Godhead with the bow of Cupid little elf, who cockered is, triumphing much in fawning fortune's lap, and floats in wealth, or seeks and sues for things that seldom hap. Lust, mighty fortune's mischievous mate, assaulteth straight this, his breast, his tooth contempteth wanted fair, and victuals homely dressed. Nor handsome houses pleaseth him, why doth this plague refuse? The simple sort, and to annoy, doth stately, stately bowers choose. How haps it matrimony, pure to bide in cottage based, 
and honest love in middle sort of men doth purchase place. And things that be of mean estate themselves restrain full well, but they that wallow in their lust, whose lately stately stomachs swell, puffed up and boistering big, with trust of kingly sceptre proud, do greater matters enterprise than may be well allowed. He that is able much to do, of power will also be, to do these things he cannot do. Now, lady, dost thou see? What things do thee beseem thus stayed on stately throne on high? Mistrust the sceptre of thy spouse, returning by and by. In Ah, yes, I think we've lost uh, the uh, speech prefix for uh, new tricks because it you did say now lady at one point so actually to just uh rewind a couple of lines lynn could you just go in from now lady does thou three lines from the end of the bottom of phaedra's last speech there possibly is more of that but uh, just to give us a run in to phaedra there um it, so it's in the middle of a of a line yeah it might a... it might be even earlier than that i, I don't know where the the, the 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 missing speech prefix live but that's that's good enough to uh to run into phaedra's next speech Okay. Now, lady, dost thou see what things do thee beseem thus stayed in stately throne on high? Mistrust the scepter of thy spouse returning by and by. In me I bear a violent and mighty pays of love, and no man's coming home again to terror may me move. He never stepped back again the welkin sky to touch, that swallowed once and sunk in gulf and glummy cave did couch. Shut up in shimmering shade for I. Yet do not thou suppose, though dreadful did his lock with bars, the bolt his dungeon close, and the bolt his dungeon close, and though the hideous helic hound do watch the grisly gates, not Theseus alone shall have his passage stopped by fates. Perhaps he pardon will the crime of love's procuring heat. Nay, churlishly, he would of old his honest wife entreat. Antiope, his bobbing buffets felt and heavy cuff. Suppose, yet thou can qualify thy husband's raging rough. Yet who can move Hippolytus, most stony, stubborn mind? He will abhor the very name, detesting womankind. And faring frantically, will give himself to single life. And shun the hated spousal bed of every married wife. Then shall he plainly, ye plainly understand his brutish Scythian blood. To follow him even through the hills, the forest thick and wood, that keeps among the clotted clives besmeared with silver snow, whose nimble heels on craggy rocks are frisking to and fro, I wish. He will resist and not be dallied with, nor coyed, nor change his chaste estate, for life of chastity devoid, and turn perhaps his cankered hate to light on thee alone, that he now bears to all. Will not he be? Will not he moved be with moan? Stark wild he is, and I have learned wild things by love to tame. He'll run away if by the seas he fly. I on the same will follow him. Remember then, thy father may be take. I may remember mine offence, my mother eke will slake. Detesting womankind, he drives and courseth them away. No strumpet's bashful fear against my breast doth hold at bay. Thy husband will be here. I wish he comes, I warrant him. Pyrothus, companion in helic dungeon dim. Thy father also he will come. A gentle-hearted sire, forgiving Ariadne's fault when she did him require. For these my silver shining locks of hoary drooping age and breast be dulled with cloying cares, restrain thy furious rage. I humbly thee beseech, even by these tender tears of mine, succor thyself, much health it is, if will to help incline. Not every jot at honesty exiled is my breast, I yield me nurse, love that denies thus under rule to rest. In quietness, let him, let him perforce be battered down. I will not let my fleeting fame and glorious bright renown, with stain to be dishonoured, this only is the gap. 
to shun the perilous path that leads to vice's training trap. My spouse let me ensue, with death this strive I shall subvert. Dear daughter, slake the ramping rage of thy unruly heart. Pluck down thy stomach stout, for this I judge thee worthy breath, in that thou dost confess thyself to have deserved death. Condemned I am to die, what kind of death now would I know? As either strangled with a rope shall I my life forego, or run upon a bloody br bloody blade with gory wound to die, or topsy-turvy headlong hurled down palace turret high, in quarrel just of chastity. Now strengthen we our hand, alas shall not my feeble age thy desperate death withstand, Forbear the sway of fury fierce. No reason can restrain him that desireth death, when death he hath determined plain, and ought to die. Sweet lady mine, thou comfort of my age, and feeble years, if in my breast prevail such mighty rage, have not regard what sounding blast in trump of fame be blown, whereby thy name in stained stock of black reproach be sown, or graft in spotless honesty. For fame doth favor small, the most upright, the better, worse. To worse, she's best of all. Let's us assay the froward mind of yonder stubborn child. It is my part to set upon the clubbish young man wild, and to compare the sturdy lad with stony heart to yield. Goddess great that art the wondrous sea, the frosty surge and stormy raging seas, whom flamy Cupid armed with scorching gleed and sharps to call his mother who doth please. This wanton elf, forth putting sappy might from steadfast bow, how surely doth he throw his venomed shafts through all thy marrow right? This boistering fire doth rankle in and glow. The secret flame that boileth in each vein. The stripe laid on shows not in open mark, but inward marrow he sucketh out amain. This boy to sounds of peace doth never hark. His scattered shafts full nimble everywhere. He darts about. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> he darts about the east that doth behold the dawning sun himself aloft to rear. From purple bed, and whether late he rolled, With ruddy lamp in western way doth glide. If any coast lie under scorching claws, Burning crab or people do abide, Beneath the clime of icy frozen paws, Of ugly gargle-faced bigger bear, That wandering still from place to place doth go, The fervent fumes and stoving heat each wear, That issues out from Cupid's burning breath bow, the flashing flames of young men's burning breast. He stirreth up, enkindling new the heat of quenched coals that wanted was to rest in drooping age and virgin's hearts to beat with strange untasted brands and doth compel the gods descending down from starry sky with counterfeited visages to dwell upon the earth to blind the lover's eye. So Phoebus, Willem forced in Thessal land to shepherd state, and made his herds did drive, his morning harp deprived of heavenly hand, with ordered pipe his bullocks did revive. Even he that trails the dusty riding rack and wheels the swaying poles with swinging shift, how oft he did he feigned forms put on his back and heavenly face with baser countenance shift. Some time a bird with silver shining wings, he fluttering flushed and languishing the death, with sweet melodious tuned voice he sings. When silly Cygnus gave up gasping breath, sometime also with a curled forehead grim, a dallying bull, he bent his stooping back to maiden sport through deeper seas to swim, while horny love made shift like oar swack. Through waters wild, his brother's perilous cost, with forward glancing breast, the stream he brake. And yet, lest he should his tender prey have lost, a troublous thought to cause his heart to quake. A bright that sways in circle murk, a darkened sky with frying fits did burn, 
and leading off the English watch, evening watch, her work, a fulgent chariot bright, heat did she turn, to Phoebus charge, to wield it otherwise. Her evening wane, Apollo learned to guide, and take his turn in lesser compass size. The damper snakes watch not their wanted tide. And late it was ere the aurora fair set forth the morning sun with gold array, while up the marble axle tree in the air, the shogging cart made crate and swagging sway. Alcamina's boisterous imp did lay aside his clattering shafts and also did refuse to wear the ramping lion's hairy hide. And emeralds for his fingers did he choose, and braided kept his ruffled staring locks. Where garters wrought on knee with seams of gold, and on his feet his dirty dabbled socks. And with the hand wherewith on he hold his clubbish bat, a thread he nimbly spun. Both Persia and fertile Lydia knew where golden sanded Patrus did run. Alcides bed the lion's case adieu, and thunder propping brawny shouldered sire that heaved and bolstered up the welkin throne in slender kirtle wrought by web of tire to jet about to please his love alone. His flame believes the heart, feels the wound. Inspired with holiness, exceeds in might, whereas the land by seas embraced round, where twinkling stars do start in welkin bright. This peevish elf, the country's all doth keep, whose quarrels sting the marble-faced rout of water nymphs, that with the waters deep, the brand that burns in breast cannot quench out, the flying fowl doth feel the foistering flames, what a cruel skirmish do the heifers make. Bricked up by lust, that nice duck, dame duck Venus frames, in furious sort for all the cattle's sake, if fearful hearts their hinds do once mistrust, in love disoil and gladly dare they fight, and bellowings out they bray to witness just their angry mood conceived in joyful, powerful sprite. The painted coast of India then doth hurt, the spotty hided tiger, then the boar doth wet his tusk to combat for his mate, and foams up mouth the ramping lions roar shake their manes when Cupid's courses move with grunts and groans the howling cries do mourn the dolphin of the raging sea doth run elephants by Cupid's blaze do burn dame nature all doth challenge as her own and nothing is that can escape her laws the range of wrath is quenched and overthrown but as it breatheth love to breathe and pause Black hate of rustling frets and cankered breast, and all got old grudge is dashed by burning love. What shall I make discourse more of the rest? Stout step dames doth this gripe to mercy move. We'll just briefly pause there at the end of Act One. Uh, we've got the, uh, the, the, the the nub of the drama. We've met Hippolytus. He likes hunting. Hunting is his thing. Um, I really liked the, 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 the sort of opening hump it, hunting gambit. There were some interesting ways the language was going. It gave a sort of sense of momentum. Um, I thought that the language the translators using got a bit bogged down with Phaedra and, and Utrex. I, 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 I felt that it, it, it struggled to sort of find itself. But yeah, the central plot point is, is there. Phaedra quite likes Hippolytus, doesn't like the husband she's been sort of foisted with uh, Theseus um, and and then we have a chorus and you know I, everyone knows I'm a huge fan of the chorus um, <clears throat> and that was a chorus doing some chorus stuff um, yeah any uh, quick thoughts before we dive into act two uh, Simon yeah I kind of agree that the opening um, is kind of nice it's kind of visual and I think it goes to show how this is this is more about poetry than drama so it better damn well be visual and at least uh, it, it succeeds in in painting pretty mental pictures for us i think mm. uh Bryony. yeah i just find it really weird that they're using a lot of shared lines at the end of huge speeches which to me it doesn't really work as well like it works well with choppy dialogue to have shared lines when the rhymes are really heavy but 
it, it's a bit weird at the end of a big speech for someone else to then have the other half of your life. Mm. Yeah. You do you get the impression that the author is trying to break things up a bit and move, move, move you know, to, to give it a bit more dynamism than perhaps some of the other uh, translations that they've done? Um, I mean, it may also come from the original source text as well, so it may be, may be Seneca's doing. Um, uh, Lynn? Yeah, this is this is poetry, not not drama. I mean, character motivation. We don't even think about that because the for the first couple of long speeches, the nurse is like, "Don't do it! Don't do it! Don't do it! Master your emotions, control it. Yeah, it's like manage your emotions." Then she's like, "Oh, I'll go ask him." <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, you know, she wants to keep her job, uh, <laughs> presumably. <laughs> uh, Alan. I just couldn't get the rhythm of that uh, last chorus speech. Right. It, looking at it again, it looks like it is again rhyming couplets, but the line length is a lot longer than we saw in yesterday's speech with, when, or day before, when we had a similar exercise which didn't seem to, to scan easily. But these are longer lines, but they're rhyming every alternate lines, effectively. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 not the easiest. Um, it's messy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, let's get deeper into the action as uh, as plot m moves forward. Act two. Uh, uh, we have uh, Phaedra and Nutrix initially. Hippolytus will join them uh, a little later on. Declare what tidings brings thou, nurse. Where is Hippolytus? To cure this puissant breach of ills, no hope there is in us nor yet to quench his flashing flame, his furies, fretting ire, doth fry in secret boiling breast. And though the smothering fire be covered close, yet bursting forth in welkin face, it fries. The sparkling flakes do glowing flash from blood red rolling eyes. She hanging down her pouched groin abhors the loathsome light. Her skittish wits and wayward mind can fancy nothing right. Her faltering legs do fail her now, down squatting on the ground. With sprawling limbs, her shittle grief doth cast her in a swoon. Now scant she, now scant she on her lithy neck holds up her giddy head, nor can commit herself to couch in rest upon her bed. Nor harboring quietness in her heart with dreary dole and plaint, she languisheth, languisheth throughout the night. And now her body faint, she bids them up to lift, and now her down again to lay, and now her crispin locks undone abroad she bids display, and straight to wrap them up again, thus fickle fancy still doth fleet, nor is contented with his wayward wandering will. <coughs> Take a pause there while we uh, wait for, for for new tricks to uh, to uh, cope with the the, the 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 horrendous length of these speeches. Uh, nor care she casteth on her health, nor eats one crumb of bread. With feeble fumbling foot upon the floor, eke she doth tread. Doth she tread? Her strength, alas, is quite consumed. Her favour sweet doth faint. Nor ready sanguine purple dye her cherry cheek doth paint. With greedy gripes of gnawing grief, her pinched limbs do pine. Her faltering legs do stagger now. The gloss of beauty fine in body alabaster bright is shrunk away and waste. Those crystal eyes that wanted were resemblance clear to cast or a radiant Phoebus gold arrays. Now nothing gentry shine, nor bear a spark of Phoebus bright her father's beams divine. The trickling tears do trail down her cheeks, dew dampish dropping still, doth wet her wary plants as on top of Taurus Hill. The wary snows with lukewarm showers to moisture turned do drop. But lo, the prince's palace is set upon, set open in the top. She lying down upon her golden bed of high estate, hurls down her wanted royal robes, which wounded heart, heart doth hate. 
maids, have our purple garments hence, and vestures wrought with gold. These crimson robes of scarlet red let not mine eyes behold, and damask weeds whereon the serra's embroider branches brave, whose silken substance gathered of their trees aloof they have. My bosom shall be swaddled in with cuttied gabardine, no golden collar on my neck, nor Indian jewels fine. The precious pearls so white shall hang no more now at mine ears, nor sweet perfumes of Syria shall polder more my hairs. My flaring ruffled locks shall dangling hang my neck about, and shoulder points, then then apace it shattering in and out. Let winds even blow it where it list, in left hand will I take a quiver of shafts, and in my right a boar spear will I shake. To cruel child Hippolytus, such one his mother was, as fleeting from the frozen seas those country coasts did pass, and drave her herds that bet with trampling feet the Athenian soil, or like the troll of Tanais, or like her will I toil, of Myrtis, that on a knot wound up her crispin locks, thus will I trot with moon moonlight targe among the woods and rocks. Leave off my bitter languishing unto the stight sort, that water thus in waves of woe, grief gives not resting port. Is any measure to be found in thy tormenting fire? Some grace at wild Diana's hand with sacrifice require. O oh, goddess great of woods, in hills that only sets thy throne, and goddess of that craggy clites at worshipped alone, thy wrathful threatenings on us all now turn to better plight. O oh, goddess that in forest wild and groves obtainest might, O oh, shining lamp of heaven, and thou the diamond of the night, O oh, threefold shape in Hecate, that on the world his face does render light with torch by turns, vouchsafe to grant thy grace to further this our enterprise and help our piteous case. O oh, mollify Hippolytus, his stubborn hardened heart, and let him learn the pangs of love and taste like bitter smart, and yield his light alert ears, entreat his brutish breast, and change his mind, and Venus bound compel him once to rest. So froward and untoward now, so crabbed, cursed, and mad, so shalt thou be with blandishing and smiling countenance clad. Thy shimmering cloud clean fading hence, then brightly shalt thou bear, and glistering horns, when while by night upon the whirling sphere, thy cloudy heeled steeds thou guides, the raging witch's charm of Thessaly, and shall not draw thee from the heavens, nor do thy harm, nor shepherd purchase shall renown. Thou comest at our request, now favor dost thou grant unto the prayers of our breast. I do it by him worshiping the solemn sacrifice, both place and time convenient by fortune doth arise. We must go craftily to work for fear we quaking stand full hard it is the busy charge of guilt to take in hand. But who of princes stand in awe, let him defy all right, cast of the care of honest, cast off the care of honesty from mind exiled quite. A man unfit is for the hest of king a bashful wight. And uh, we have the return of Hippolytus to the scene. Oh, nurse, how chance thy limping limbs do creep into this place with blubbered cheeks and leaden looks with sad and mourning face? Doth yet my father Theseus with health enjoy his life? Doth Phaedra yet enjoy her health, my stepdame and his wife? Oh, forgo these fears and gently come thy blessed hap to take, for care constraineth me to mourn with sorrow for thy sake that hurtfully thou lo loadst thyself with pangs of plunging pain. Let him rub on in misery whom destiny doth constrain. But if that any yield himself to wail waves of willful woe and doth torment himself, deserves his weal for to forego. 
the which he knows not how to use. Tush, be not so demure, considering how thy years do run, take part of sport and play. Let Mary Bacchus cause thee cast these clogging cares away and reap the fruit of sweet delight belonging to thy years. For lusty youth with speedy foot full fast away it wears. Erst tender love, erst Venus feeds the young man's appetite. Be blithe, my boy. Why widow-like liest thou alone by night? Shake off thy solemn sadness, man, that hearty youth doth spill. Huff, huff, roist it out courageously, take bridle at thy will. Let not the flower of pluming years, all fruitless, fight, fade away. God pointeth every time his task and leads in due array each aid by order lust as mirth, the sappy youthful years afford freight with gravity becomes hoary hairs. Why dost thou bridle thus thyself and dull thy pregnant wit? That corn that did but lately sprout above the ground, if it be rank of root, yet in the husk with interest at large, unto the hoping husbandman shall travel all discharge. With branching bough above the wood, the tree shall raise his top, whom rusty hand of cankered hate did never spill nor lop. The pregnant wits are ever more and more prone to purchase praise if noble hearts by freedom franked be nourished from decays. Thou churlish country clown, hodge-like, not knowing courtly life, delight in drowsy doting youth without a loving wife. Dost thou suppose that to this end them nature, dame nature did us frame to suffer hardness in this world and abide the same? With courses and Careries fit the prancing steeds to tame? Or bicker else with battles fierce and broils of bloody war? That sovereign sire of heaven earth, when fates do us detar, with signs and plagues prognosticate, provided half with heed, for to repair the damage done with new begotten seed. Go to, let bedding in the world be used once no more, that still mankind from age to age beholds and doth restore. The filthy world deformed would lie an irksome, ugly stay. No floating ships on wandering seas should hoisted sails display. No fowl should scour in azure sky, no beast to woods repair, and only whisking winds should whirl amid the empty air. But divers dreary deaths drive one mankind to dumpish grave. The seas, the sword, and traitorous trains whole countries wasted have. Yet for to limit forth our league, there is no destiny thick. So down to black fastigian damps, we of ourselves do sink. Let youth that never felt the joys in Venus lap which lie, Allow the solitary life, which ever thou espy, and hurly burly shall become for term of one man's life, and work it one destruction by mutual hate and strife. And therefore follow nature's course of life, the sovereign guide. Resort unto the town with men delight thee to abide. No life is more devoid of sin and free from grievous thralls and keeping fashions old than that which leaving townish walls doth take delight in pleasant woods. He is not set on fire, in rage sore, with burning bile of covetous desire. Who hath addict himself among the mountains wild to live, not pricked with prattling people's brute, no credit doth he give. To the vulgar sort disloyal still, and to the better part, nor cankered rancor pale, doth gnaw his black and fretting heart, nor fickle favour forceth he. he Bound doth not obey the peace of sceptre proud, but wields the massy sceptre sway. At ebbing honours gapes he not, nor moils for fleeting muck, removed far from hovering uh, hope and dread of backward luck. Not bitter gnawing envy, rank tears him with 
tooth unkind, not acquainted with the mischief that in cities and in mind of people presseth thick, nor quakes at every blast that flies with guilty conscience to himself, nor frames himself to lies, nor covets rich with thousand pillars close his head to shroud, nor gilds his beams with glistening gold, for fancy fond and proud, nor gushing streams of blood upon his innocent altars flow, nor bullocks bright their hundred heads as white as flaky snow, do yield to axe, while scattered is on the altar sacred grain, but all the quiet country round at will he doth obtain and harmless walketh to and fro amid the open air, and only for the brutish beast contrives a trapping snare. Another while upon the swift Alpheus banks he walks, now up and down the breary breaks of bushy woods he stalks, where lukewarm learner's crystal flood with water clear doth shine, and charging and changing course his channel out another way doth twine and hear the piteous plaining birds with chirping charms do chide and branches trembling shake whereon soft windy puffs do glide and spreading beeches old do stand to fast and shake my shanks to stamp and dance it doth me good on running rivers banks or else upon a withered clod to seal a snap of to steal a nap of sleep whereas the four the fountain flows amain with gushing waters deep, or else among the balmy flowers outbraying savours sweet, whereas with pleasant humming noise the babbling brook doth fleet. The apples beaten of the tree do ravening hunger staunch, and strawberries gathered of the bush soon fill with hungry paunch. He shuns assaults that doth himself with regal uh, from regal royal hold, estates do quaff their dreadful drink in bowls of massy gold. How trim it is water to lap in palm of naked hand. The sooner drowsy Morpheus binds thy brows with sleepy band. The careless corpse doth rest at ease upon the hardest couch. The cabin base haunts not by nooks to prig and filch a pouch. In house of many corners, blind his head, he doth not hide. He loves to come abroad and in the light to be espied. The heaven bear witness of his life. They lived in this wise. I think that scattered did of gods in older time arise. No doting covetous blind desire of gold in them was found. No stones nor stakes set up in field, distinct the parted ground. The sailing ship with brazen stem cut not the watering wave. But every man doth know his coast and how much he should have. No hugey ranches raised were, nor ditches delved deep nor counter murd castle strong the walled towns to keep the soldier was not busied with blunted tools to wet nor wrapping pellets cannon shot the barred gates down bet nor soil with yoked oaks uh, yoked ox was strained to bear the cutting share the field even fertile of itself did feed the world with fair the plentiful abundant woods great wealth by nature gave a house of nature eke they had a dim and darksome cave the covetous mind to scrape up wealth and desperate furious ire and greedy lust that eggeth on the mind all set on fire first break the bands and eager th thirst of bearing sway stepped in to be the stronger's ravening prey the weaker did begin and might well for oppressed right the naked fist found out to scratch and scruff and uh, to scratch and cuff to box and bum with dealing blows about the narry logs and snaggy shive were framed weapons strong. The gotten tree ungrained was with pikes of iron long. No, nor the rusty fortune then did hang along the side, nor a helmet crest upon the hedge stood perking up for pride. Pale, spiteful grief invented tools, and warlike Mars, his brain, contrived new slates. A thousand kind of deaths he did ordain. By means hereof each land is filled with clotted gore shed with streams of blood the seas are dyed to hue of sanguine red then mischief wanting measure gone through every house to pass no kind of vicious villainy that practice wanted was 
by brother, brother, reft of breath, and eke the father's life by hand of child. Eke murthered was the husband of his wife, and mother lewd on mischief set, destroyed their bodies. Seed I overpass the stepdame with her guilt and heinous deed, and know where pity's plan, uh, planted is, as in the brutish beast. But womankind is in mischief, excuse me, but womankind in mischief is ringleader of the rest, the instrument of wickedness in kindling first desire, whose vile ancestress whoredom see so many towns on fire, so many nations fall to war, eke kingdoms overthrown and raised from the ground to crush so many people down. Let other pass, by Jason's wife Medea may we find, by her alone, that women are a plaguy, crabbed kind. I, for one woman's fault of blame, shall everyone have part? I hate, detest, abhor, I loathe, I curse them from my heart. Be it reason, right, or nature's law, or vengeance, fury fell, it likes me to abhor them still. The burning fire shall dwell and bide with quenching water first, the dangerous quicksand shall promise ships with safetyness upon the shore, the, the, the shore to land, and western Thetis sunk aloof and drenched in deepest nook shall force the rudding, the shall force the ruddy morning sun from scarlet skies to look the wolf shall yield his fleeting, his fleering chaps to suck the teat of dough, ere won by women's love. To her I crouch and stoop alow. Love bridles oft with snaffling bits the stubborn wayward heart. Behold, thy mother's native land in Scythia's every part, the savage women feel the force of Venus' yoking ban. Thou only child, thy mother, had dost this well understand. This only comfort of my mother must I keep behind, that lethal unto me it is to hate all womankind. Even as the stiff and sturdy rocks have watered waves withstood and dasheth back from shore aloof the foamy flapping flood, so lightly he contemns my talk. But favor runneth mad because of this my long delay with crushing cares he clad. What will she do? I mean, alas, how shall she now be sped? Her breathless body to the ground drops suddenly down dead. A sallow hue like ghastly death or strikes her frenzy face. Look up and speak. Behold thy dear sweetheart doth thee embrace. And Phaedra returns to the action. Alas to float in waves of woe who me revives again to pinch my mind with pining pangs and bitter brunts of pain. What ease to me it was, when as I lay in trance at rest, why dost thou thus the pleasure of renewed life detest? O heart be bold, essay and seek thy purpose to attain. Be not abashed, nor faced out with churlish words again. Who faintly craveth any boon, gives courage to deny. The greatest portion of my crime dispatched, ere now have I. Shame seeks too late to purchase place within our bashful brow. Sith, that in foul and loathsome love we have delight ere now. If I obtain my will, then shall our wedlock cloak the crime. Success corrupteth honesty with wickedness sometime. Behold, this secret place is void from any witness by. My faltering tongue doth in my mouth my tale begun deny. Great force constraineth me to speak, but greater hold my peace. O heavenly ghosts, I you protest, tis this that doth me please. Cannot the mind that covers talk in words at will outbrast? Light cares have words at will, but great do make us sore aghast. Mother, the grief that galls your heart, come, whisper in mine ear. The name of mother is too proud a name for me to bear. Importing puissant powers too much, the fancy of my mind, it doth behove a baser name of less renown to find. Me, if thou please, Hippolytus, thy loving sister call, or waiting maid, and rather so, no drudgery spare I shall. If thou through thick and thin in snows to travail me desire, or else command me for to run through coals of flaming fire, 
or set my foot on Pindus' frozen rocks, it irks me not, or if thou will me rashly run through scorching fire hot, or ravening roots of savage beasts, I will not slowly rest, with gory lance of naked blade my bowels to unbreast. These kingdoms left, me, left to me in charge, wield thou of them the sway, and take me as thy humble mate, it fits me to obey. And thee to give commandment, it is no woman's feat, to claim her title to the crown, to reign in parent's seat. Thou flourishing amid the pride of lusty youthful race, supply a valiant prince's room with father's golden mace, protect thy humble suppliant, defend thy lowly maid, embraced in mercy's bosom, at thy feet so meekly laid, take pity on a healy widow's woe and wretched plight. The god that reigns aloft forbids such luckless lot to light. My father Theseus, safe in health, will straight return again. The lowering lord that deep in strong infernal gale do reign, and damned upon and damned up always to pass from Stygian puddle glum, whereby to breathing bodies left alone the ground to come. Shall he let scape the cloiner of his joys from spousal bed? unless that Pluto's fancy fond by doting love be led. The righteous gods will make for him a right returning way. But while through fear our wavering wills in hovering balance sway, upon my brethren will I cast a due and earnest care, and thee defend. Believe not that in widow's plight ye are, and I myself will unto the supply my father's place. Something oh, love. Oh, love, alas, of credit light. Oh, love of flickering face. Is this enough that he hath said? Entreatance will I try. Dear child, rue on my wretched woe. Do not my suit deny. But lurking close doth couch in secret mourning breast of me. Fain would I speak, yet loath I am. <laughs> what mischief may this be? Such mischief as you would not think could light in mother's mind. With mumbling voice perplexed, ye waste your words against the wind. A vapour hot and love do glow within my bedlam breast. It raging rank, no inward juice undried leaves in rest. The fire sunk in scalded guts through every vein doth fry, and smothering close in seething blood as flashing flame doth fly with eager sweeping sway along up burning beams on high. Enamoured thus with love entire of Theseus dost thou rage? Even so it is, the lovely looks of Theseus' former age, which he, a sweet, well-favoured boy, did bear with comely grace, that when pretty dapper cutted beard on clear complexioned face, gan sprout on naked chin when he the kennel's clotted bl blood beheld of mongrel minotaur and crooking maze withstood. By groping long untwined threads, the beams of beauty bright, that shone then in his face, his crispen locks with labels height, smooth stroked lay, his scarlet cheeks by nature painted bright, polded with spots of golden gloss and sharp assaults of love, prevailed in his fleshly arms, what grace doth shine above. In the... Diane's face, or fiery crested Phoebus mine, or else in comely countenance of this lovely face of thine. Such Theseus had, when Ariadne's eye he did, a, he did delight, thus portly pacing did he bear his noble head upright. It is no counterfeited gloss that shineth in thy face, in thee appears thy manly father's stern and lowering grace. Thy mother's crabbed countenance eke resembled in some part, puts in full well a seeming a seemliness to pleaseth the looker's heart. The Scythian awful majesty, with Greekish favour sweet, appears, if thou had with thy sire attempt the seas of Crete, one of those seven from Athens sent elect by luckless lot, to pay such bloody tribute with King Minos of them got, the ravening and bloodthirsty Minotaurus foul to feed. My sister Ariadne would, for thee, have spun the thread, therewith, therewith in crafty compass maze, to lead thee to and fro, 
in ugly labyrinthus long returning from thy foe. Thee, thee, O oh sister dear, where so in all the heaven thou art, and shinest bright with blazing beams transformed into a star. I thee beseech, come succour me, with like distress now cloyed. Alas, as steely sisters twain, one kindred hath destroyed. The sire thy smart, the sun hath brewed the bane that me doth lease. Behold an imp of royal race laid humbly at thy knees, yet never stained and undefiled and harmless innocent. To thee alone of all the world my crouching knees are bent, and for the nuns my haughty heart and princely courage stout, I did abate that humbly thee with tears entreat I mort. O oh, sovereign sire of gods, dost thou abide so long to hear this vile abomination? So long dost thou forbear to see this heinous villainy? If now the skies be clear, wilt thou henceforth at any time with furious raging hand dart out thy cracking thunder dint and dreadful lightning's brand? Now batter down with bouncing bolts the rumbling skies, let fall that foggy clouds with Dusky drooping day may cover all, and force the backward starring starts to slide a slope with all, thou starry crested crown, and titan pranked with beamy blaze, come out with staring bush upon thy kindred's guilt to gaze, dash out and drown thy leaming lamp eclipsed in glummy skies, to shrink in shimmering shape, why doth thy right hand not arise, O guise of gods and men? How haps the world yet doth not burn, and kindled with thee forked brand? Three forked brand, on me thy thunder turn, dash out on me thy bobbing bolt, and let thy fiery flake world out with force, burnt cinders of my wasted carcass make. For guilty, Jove, I guilty am, deserved death I have, my stepdame's fancy I have fed. Shall I, most sinful slave, be worthy thought to blot my father's honourable bed? Canst thou for mischief such thought me alone be lightly sped? Oh, caitiff thou of womankind, for guilt that bears the bell, whose enterprise heinous evil doth passingly excel, thy monster-breeding mother's fault with whoredom she alone defiled herself, when storming sighs with sorrow gan she groan through beastly lust of bull, till it the minotaurus, the minotaurus sire in act of generation had quenched her foul desire. And yet the time concealed long, the grim twice-shaped seed at length be rayed with bulic brows, thy mother's naughty deed, the doubted infant did disclose that wicked womb she bare, with thrice, yea, four times, blessed fate of life, Deprived ye are, whom swollen of watering seas have sucked me cankered hate of breath, despoiled hath, and traitorous trains have quelled my daunting death with stepdames, banes, and sorcery, O oh father, father mine, I rue thy lot, not to be slain of milder stepdame thine. This mischief greater, greater, fair the wickedness doth pass that by Medea, desperate dame of cultures practised was. And I do know what uncouth luck upon our stock hath light. The thing that we should shun we seek. It is not in my might to rule myself. Through burning fire run after thee I shall. Through raging seas and craggy rocks, through fleeting rivers all, which boiling waters ruffling raise, that way so go thou will. I bedlam white with frantic fits will follow, follow still. O oh, stately lord, before thy feet yet fall I once again. Do not with shameless fawning pause my spotless body stain. What meaneth this? With hawsing me to embrace sheep doth begin. Draw, draw my sword. With stripes deserved I'll pay her on the skin. Her hair about my left hand wound. Her head I backward wired. No blood, Diana, better spent. Thine altar hath yet died. Hippolytus, now dost thou grant me mine own desire. Thou cools my ramping rage, this is much more than I require. But saving thus mine honesty, I may be given to death, by bloody stroke received of thy band to loose my breath. Avaunt, 
Avaunt, preserve thy life. Let my hand nothing crave. This filet sword that thou hast touched, no longer will I have. What bathing lukewarm tannays may I defile it obtain, whose cleansing watery channel pure may wash me clean again. Oh, what Spiotis muddy mere, what with rough barbarian wave that boards on Pontus' roaring sea, not Neptune, grandsire grave, with all his ocean folding flood can purge and wash away this dunghill foul of sin. Oh, would, oh, savage beast, I say. A crime detected is, O oh soul, why droops thou all aghast? Let us peach Hippolytus with fault upon him cast. And let us lay unto his charge how he, by might unjust, deflower would his father's wife. With mischief, mischief must concealed be. The best is thy foe first to invade, since that the crime is yet unknown, who can be witness made that either first we enterprised or suffered of him then. Come, come, in haste, Athenians, O troops of trusty men. Help, help, Hippolytus does come. He comes, that villain vile, that ravisher, that lecher foul, perforce would us defile. He threatens us, denouncing death, and glittering blade doth shake at her who chastely doth withstand and doth for terror quake. Lo, headlong hence for life and death, he took him to his flight and leaves his sword in running rash with ghastly fear of fright. A token of his enterprise detestable we keep. Sirs, cherish her that storming sighs with pensive breast doth weep. Her ruffled hair and shattered locks still let them draggle down. This witness of his villainy so bare unto the town. O oh, lady mine, be of good cheer. Pluck up your sprites again. Why dost thou tearing thus thyself abhor all people's sight? Not blind mischance, but fancy want to make a shameless wight. Hippolytus, even as the raging storm away doth fly, more swift than whirling wind, western wind, up tumbling clouds and sky, more swift than flashing flames that catch their course with sweeping sway, when stars he tossed with whisking winds, long fiery drakes display, fame. Wondering at of older time, our ancestors' renown, farewell with thee and bear away old worship from our town. So much thy beauty brighter shines, as much more clear and fair, the golden moon, the glorious globe, full furnished in the air, doth shine, when as her fiery tips of waning horns do close, when lifting up a fulgent face in ambling when she goes, Upon her night watch to attend the stars of lesser night, their darkened faces hide as he, the messenger of night. That watchword gives of the evening tide and Hesperus he hight, that gladdest, gladding erst was bathed in seas, and he the same again, when shades be shrunk, doth then the name of Lucifer obtain. Thou Bacchus, blessed bairn of love, in warlike India born, Thou lad that evermore dost wear thy hairy bush unshorn, whose javelin tuft with ivy bunch, the tigers make a dread, and dust with labelled might I use to prank thy horny head. Politus his staring locks, thou Bacchus shall not stain to wonder at thy loving locks, too much that do thou, do thou refrain. Who, as the people do report, the Ariadne right for beauty's name preferred before bacchus the bromius height a brittle jewel beauty is on mortal men employed thou gift that for a season short of mankind art enjoyed how soon alas with feathered foot hence dust thou fading slide the parching summer's vapour hot in verse most pleasant pride so withers not the meadows green when as the scorching sun in tropic line a burning crab full hot at noon doth run and on her shorter cloudy wheels and horses soon the night with wanny leaves down hang the heads of withery lilies white 
The balmy blooms and sprouting flower do leave the naked head as beauty bright, whose radiant beams into coral cheeks is spread, is dashed in the twink of eye. No day as yet did pass, in which not his beauty breath, some pearl's person was. For favour is a fleeting thing, what right of any wit? Will unto frail and fickle joy his confidence commit? Take pleasure of it while thou mayst. For time with stealing steps will under mint on our pass, straight in worser lapse. Why flowest thou to the wilderness to seek thy succour there? Thy beauty bides not safer in the wayless woods than here. If Titan hoist his tottering cart on point of full midday, thee shrouded close among the brakes, the naiads will stay. The gadding troop that beauty's boys do lock in fountains fair to frame their seat, then unto the insenseless sleep repair. Shall wanton fairies, nymphs of friths, that on the hills do walk, which dryads mountain goblins haunt, that use on hills to stalk. Or when from high star-bearing pole Diana down did look, on thee that next to old Arcades in heaven by his seat hath took. She could not wield her weltering wane, and yet no foggy cloud eclipsed her gleaming globe, but we with turking bound pans aloud can make a noise aggrieved at her dead and glowing light. We deemed her charmed with magic verse, a thessity which is sprite. Thou didst cause a business, and made us sin a maze, while at thy pleasant lovely looks the goddess stood in gaze. That rules the reign of cloudy night, she stopped her running race. God grant that seldom biting frost may pinch this comely face. That seldom scorching sunny beams thy cheeks with freckles dye, the marble blue in quarry pits of Paris that the fly. <clears throat> Bears not so brave a glimpsing gloss as pleasant seems thy face, whose brows with manly majesty support an awful grace, and forehead fraught with gravity of father's countenance old, his ivory coloured neck, although compared to Phoebus' eye, ye would. <clears throat> his locks that never lacking knew, itself displaying wide on shoulder points to set them out. And also doth them hide. <clears throat> thy curled forehead seems thee well, and eke thy knotted hair, that crumpled lies undight in thee, a manly grace doth bear. Thou gods, O fierce and valiant, perforce doth chase and far, dost overmatch in the length of limbs, though yet but young thou art. Thou bears as big and boisterous bronze as Hercules, thy breast. Then champion Mars, more hourly bolstered, out with broader chest, on back of horny hoofed steeds, if yachting thou doth ride, with bridle in thine arrived hand, more handsome canst thou guide, the trampling scylla horse of Spart, then princely Castor could, thy leathern hoop loop amid thy dart, with former fingers hold, and drive thy lance with all thy pith, the active men of Crete, that with their pitched darts afar do learn the mark to hit. They shall not hurl a slender reed, but after Parthian guise, to shoot an arrow if they list into the opening skies. Unsped without some bird attained, it shall not be light on ground, and bathed with lukewarm blood of guts in gory smoking wound, and from amid their lofty clouds down shaft shall thou shalt thou fetch thy prey. Few men, mark well the time, have borne beauty and plagued away. God send thee better luck, and grant thy noble personage, my pass unto the happy steps and stretched to dump his age. What mischief an attempt escapes a woman's witless rage, most heinous crime she means to lay to guiltless young men's charge. Thinks to make her matter good with hair that's rent and large. She tauth the seat, the pranking of her head with watered plants. A skirt sly device, no kind, crafty kind, a woman's fetches wants. But who is this that in his face such printly port to bear? 
whose lofty looks with stately pies high vaunts his heart hath rear. Like lusty young Carithus, he looketh in the face, but that a fainting fellow, pale, his bleakish cheeks disgrace, and filthy baggage hangeth on his hash hair raised upright. Lo, Theseus is again restored to earthly light. And then we'll just pause briefly at the end of Act 2. So, yeah, this is where we start hitting the more oh, tricksy elements of this particular play because, yeah, we've got Hippolytus, who is an unashamed misogynist. He's just going, women, aren't they awful? Women, keep them away from me. And the chorus is sort of doing a bit of that work as well. Uh, so, yeah, it's... um. It's uh, tricky, and especially as we're going to get to also the response to that uh, is going to also lead us into some problematic territory as well, which uh, many authors have dealt with since. Uh, Bryony, any thoughts? Yeah, uh, just obviously I don't agree with the misogyny at all, but she is cracking on to her stepson. Like, you know, that's not cool. Mm. She's, she's kind of supporting his case with a bit there. In trigger warnings yeah <laughs> yeah oh, yes don't worry it gets worse uh yes um uh lynn yeah I, I i think that you know there's potential here that the misogyny is really undermining because when he when hippolytus says what does he say something about just keep your filthy paws off my unstained body or you know the line i'm i'm referring to don't don't touch me um you know if a woman were saying that to a man we would be on her side we, you know if a stepfather were coming on to his stepdaughter we would find that shocking and awful and gross um so i think this you know this sort of has potential to be a, a sort of meditation on how we judge differently depending on gender and, and why shouldn't a politist have control over his own body uh but uh but the, the fact that he's such a jerk and such a woman hater <laughs> you know so sort of undermines the potential for I, I think some really interesting um insight in gender flipping that that um that that sort of sexual misconduct that's going on here mm. uh, Simon. Yeah, I was going to say, something occurred to me halfway through. First of all, the, obviously, the kind of, um, the, there's lots of allusions to hunting and quarry, and, um, you know, the, there's there's uh, a big long thing, which uh, the, the description about the, the, which felt like a hind kind of uh, kind of getting up, and then it ends up being almost a politist. That's the, that's the hunted quarry, if you look at it that way. But um, something, something really struck me about a modern uh, reference, but I don't know if you guys know, I'm sure a lot of people um, at home would know, Night of the Hunter, uh, which is most famous for the kind of the um, the film with uh, Robert Mitchum. Um, I, I'm going to have to Google this because I there are so many parallels. I don't know if, if you guys are familiar with it, Night of the Hunter, but um, there's there's you know one of the most famous speeches because he's he's a woman hater. He plays a priest, but you know it's, it's uh, there's a there's a very famous speech where he's on about like soft things and curly things and how he detests them this woman is and i i it really struck me i'm probably just reading coincidences in but uh i'm wondering if the whoever wrote the the film and then i think the original novel um was influenced by this at all but it's a it's something that is ridiculously ridiculously paralleled it's very strange mm. uh and yes and there, there are other uh, the versions of this tale by other authors uh, uh, down the ages um, which definitely are reverberating uh, off this text so it does turn up and uh, uh, in different ways um, uh, and different times uh, Alan and then we'll move on yeah I think that we ought just to have an all-purpose trigger warning Greek myth <laughs> yeah you know anyone who takes any of the Greek myths as a role model is probably going to be seriously in trouble <laughs> yeah, I mean the 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 thing is that the Phaedra's response to being rejected is extreme here because she's now going to be accusing him of uh, of sexual assault. Uh, so yeah, content warning going forward. This is going to get nasty, uh, 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 rather than just uh, people expressing opinions. Uh, there's some actions that are going to have some consequences uh, as we go into Act Three, and we have a rival of uh, uh, tag teaming here. There's, uh, Chorus is now turning into Theseus, and I'll be reading the chorus from now on. Enter Theseus, and there's also Nutrix. 
At length I scape the glowing glades of grim eternal night, and eke the underpropping pole that each infernal sprite doth muffle in, shut up in shades to low how my dazzled eyes can scant abide the long desired light of marble skies. Lucius now four offerings of Tripolitamus divides and counterpays night with day with night, now four times Libra hides. I earnest in my parlous toil in doubt what luck to have, twixt dread of ghastly death and hope my feeble life to save some spark of life still in my breathless limbs abiding was when as embarked on irksome sticks alcides down did pass to succour me in dire distress who when the helic hound from tartar's grisly gates in chains he dragged above the ground and also me he carried up into the world again my tired limbs doth fatty pith of former strength restrain my feeble faltering legs to quake, what lucking toil it was, from bottom deep to reflect on, to whirl the loaf to pass. What dreary dole and morning noise is that which beats mine ears? Let some declare it unto me, who plubbered so with tears, lamenting loud and languishing within our gates appears. This entertainment fit is for a ghost that comes from hell. A stubborn heart and obstinate in Phaedra's breast doth dwell. With desperate mind to slay herself, our tears she does despise. And giving up the gasping ghost, alas, my lady dies. Why should she kill herself? Why die, her spouse being come again? For this, my lord, with hasty death, she would herself have slain. These troublous words, some perilous thing, I wot not what to tell. Speak plain, what lumpling of oh, glutton grief her lady heart doth quell. She doth complain her case to none, but pensively and sad, she keeps it secret to herself, determined thus she had to bear about with her the bane wherewith she means to die. Hi, hide thee fast, I pray thee now, now have we need to hide. Our palace locked with stately stoops, Set open by and by. And Phaedra appears. O oh, madam mate of spousal bed, thus dost, dost thou entertain the coming of thy loving spouse and welcome home again thy long desired husband's face? Why takes thou not away my sword out of my hand and dost not share my sprites, I say, nor show us me what doth the breath out of the body chase? Alas, my valiant Theseus, even for thy royal mace, wherewith thy kingdom thou dost wield and buy the noble reign of thy beloved posterity and coming home again, and for the worship that is due unto my fateful grave, oh, let me die and suffer me deserved death to her. What cause us compelleth thee to die? If I the cause of death disclose, then shall I not obtain the losing of my breath. No worldly wight, save I myself alone, the same shall hear. Art thou afraid to tell it in thy husband's bashful ear? Speak out, thy secret shroud I shall within my faithful breast. What thou would other to conceal, keep thou it first in rest. Thou shalt not suffered be to die. From him that wisheth, wisheth that death, death never can be separate. The crime that loss of breath ought to revenge, show it to me. Forsooth, because I live. Alas, do not my trifling tears thy stony stomach grieve. It is the sweetest death, when one doth loathsome life forsake, bereft of such as should for him most woeful weeping make. Stand she still, ma'am? Ye crooked old ill-favoured hobbling trot, her nurse for stripes and clogging bands shall utter every jot that she forbid her hath to tell. In iron chains her bind, let toying whips ring out perforce the secrets of her mind. Now I myself will speak, yet stay. 
Why dost thou turn aside from me thy weeping countenance? Thy tears, why dost thou hide that sudden gush, that gushing sudden from thine eyes stream down thy cheeks apace? Why hidest thou thy flying floods with coat before thy face? Thee, thee, creator of the heavens, to witness I do call, and thee, O glittering, fiery gleed of crystal sky withal, and Phoebus, thou, from whom at first our royal race hath run, with fawning face and flattering words, in suit I was not won. For naked sword and thundering threats, appalled was I not. My bruised bones abode the blow, and stripes when sore he smote. This blemish black of foul defame my blood shall purge again. Declare what villain is he that our honour so doth stain? Whom least ye would mistrust. To know who tis, full sore I long. This sword will tell, which saw affright when people thick in throng. Resorted fast, the lecher vile for haste did leave behind. Because the poor preasing fast, he dreaded, because the people preasing fast, he dreaded in his mind. Ah, oh, out alas, so oh, woe is me, what villainy see I, alas. What uncouth monster foul of mischief I espy. Behold the royal ivory engraved and purid fine, and pots with golden studs upon the enamelled heart haste does shine. Jewel of Actia land. But whither fled is he? With light heel running sore dismayed, these servants did him see. O sacred holiness. Sorry. O sacred holiness. O Jove, between whose mighty hands the marble pole with weltering sway and course directed stands, and thou that second scepter wields in foamy fighting wave, why does this cursed brood with such this winged wicked vengeance rave? Hath he been fostered up in Greece, or craggy Taurus wild, among hard ragged rocks and caves, and some savage Scythian child? Or else in brutish Colchis Isle, by desert Phaeus flood? Cat after kind he is, and will the unkindly bastard blood Return unto his kindred's course, when first his line he claims? This frantic fury up and down comes of the warlike dames, To hate the loyal leagues of love, and shunning long the use Of Cupid's camp, with tag and rag her body to abuse. Become as good as ever twanged, O oh, detestable kind, No better soil by any means Can change thy filthy mind. The brutish beasts themselves to loathe, The abuse which Venus draws, And simple shamefastness Itself observeth nature's laws. Where is the brag of majesty, And feigned portly grace, Of manly mind that hateth new, And old things doth embrace? O double-dealing life, thou cloakst deceitful thoughts in breast, And settest out a forehead fair, where frowned mind doth rest. The saucy jack with bashful brow doth malapertness hide, The rash of the desperate dick by stillness is unspied, With show of right religion knaves villainy maintain, And guileful meal-mouthed gentlemen do hold with speaking plain. Daily wanton carpet nights of hardness, boast and prate. That wood ranger, that brain sick beast, who lived in chaste estate, an undefiled bachelor, thou crude and homely clown. Thus dost thou watch thy time to breed this blot in my renown. To make me cuckold first of all, did it delight thy mind, first falling to thy spousal sport with mischief most unkind. Now, now, to thee, supernal Jove, most hearty thanks I yield, that when my first antipathy to dre dreary death I quilled, that gone to dampish Stygian dens I left the thee not behind. Thy mother, go, go, vagabond rage, range about to find strange foreign soils and outcast lands, aloof at world his end. And isles enclosed the ocean flood, To hell thy soul shall send. Beneath 
among the Antipodes, thyself of harbouring speed, throughout, though in the utmost lurking nook, thou shroud thy minching head. Among the grisly palaces, thou climb off lofty pole, or maced above the pottering snow, advance thy cursed soul. Beyond the brunt of winter floors and threatening rigor pass, and stormy wrath with rumbling wrath of icy Boreas, with vengeance, vengeance, violent fast, hurling after thee with daunting plagues and pestilence, thy sins shall scourged be. For life and death about the world in every lurking hole, O fugitive, it shall not cease still to pursue thy soul. But seek and search for thee I shall in lands that lie afar, all corners blind and caves shut up, dens locked with bolt and bar. A thousand ways unpassable, no place shall me withstand. My cursings black shall light on thee, there where revenging hand. With weapon cannot work ye harm. Thou knowest that Neptune great, my sire, who floats on floods and waves, with forked mace doth beat. Give license freely unto me, three boons to choose and crave, which willingly the god hath grant, and swore I shall it have. Protesting ugsome Stygian lake, and hallowed hath his vow. Breaker of the rustling waves, avouch thy promise now. Yet let never more Hippolytus behold the eclipsed light, and for the father's wrathful rage, the cursed child down smite, to wail among the ghastly sprites. So, father, bend thy might to give, alas, this loathsome aid, and to thy needy son, I of thy majesty divine exact, not to be done. This chiefest boon, till puissant pays of ills to us oppress, in bottom deep of poiling tartar pit and sore distress, in grisly limbo jaws, my gargle faced dites dim, amid the crumpling threatening brows of helic Pluto grim, to claim thy promise made to me, as then I did refrain. Now, sire, thy faith, thy promise due, perform to me again. Yet dost thou stay, why run or not the waltering waves yet pushed through foggy cloud in dusky skies with stormy blasts outrushed? Unfold the mantle black of night and roll away the skies, enforce the fighting floods brast out with mounting waves to rise and conjure up the water hags that in the rocks do keep the ocean surges swelling high, cast up from bottom deep. O oh, nature grand, I am so great of heavenly sprites. Eat Jove that guides Olympus' mighty sway, that rakes the race of twinkling heavenly lights on spinning sphere and order thus for a the straggling course of roaming planets high, and wields about the whirling axle tree the weltering poles, the eternal course of sky, to keep in frame what works such care in thee that erst the cold which hoary winter makes unclothes the naked wood, and now again the shades return unto the breary breaks. Now doth the star of summer lion reign, whose scalded neck with boiling heat doth rye, per breaking flames from fiery flaming jaws, with scorching heat the parched corn do dry, each season so his kindly course in draws. But thou, that yields these things of massy might, by whom the huge world with eagle peas, even balance doth in keeping compass right, each sphere by measured weight that justly sways. Alas, why dost thou bear a wretchless breast toward mankind, not casting any care, that wicked men with mischief be oppressed, and eke to see that good men well do fare? Dame Fortune, topsy-turvy, turns at will the world, and deals her doll with blinding hand, and fosters vice-maintaining mischief of ill. Foul lust triumphs on good men brought in band. Deceit in stately court the sway doth wield. In lordings lewd the vulgar sort delight, with glee to see the mace of might they yield. Some magistrates, they do both love and spite, and pensive virtue brought to bitter bale, receives reward that doth of right arise. The continent to prison need doth hail. The lecture reigns enhanced by his vice. O oh, fruitless shame, O oh, counterfeited port! But what new May this messenger now bring, who with main peace comes posting in this sort, and stays with morning countenance with at the king. 
Act four, Nuncius and Theseus. Oh, heavy hap and cruel chance of servants, slavish state. Why am I post to bring the news of this ill-favored fate? Be not abashed, the ruthful rack with courage to declare. My breast against the brunt of broils, still armed I prepare. My faltering tongue does speech unto my gluttering grief deny. Our stop with sorrow shrunk and sore. What cares to crush his cry? Hippolytus, I woe is me, is slain by doleful death. Now, father, do I know my son bereaved of his breath? But why the leecher life is lost? Show in what sort he died. In all post haste, as fugitive to shun the town he hide, once having caught his cutting horse apace, he scuds away. His prancing palfrey straight he doth with collars close array. With curbed bits their snaffled heads at will he bridles in. Then talking much unto himself to curse, he doth begin his native soil. Alas, dear father, father, still he cries, and angry lasheth with his whip while loose his bridle lies. Then suddenly a huge swole gan swell among the deep and starteth up into the stars no Pipling wind doth sweep along the seas in heaven so lithe, no noise at all there was. The seas full calm, calm even as the, their kindly tide doth drive them pass. Nor yet no boisterous southern wind that still sand, that still sand turmoils, nor yet the foamy ramping surge, the raging gulf up boils, heaved up by western puffs, when as the rocks with flapping flash do shake, and drown Lucati's clive, the hoary foam doth dash. The tumbling waves together tossed on hills are heaped high. The swelling swole with monster, much to land a loaf doth fly. Nor only shaken ships in seas do suffer rack hereby. The land in hazard lies of storms, a waltering wave is rolled. In tottering wise, a wallowing gulf with winding compass fold, drives down, I know not what withal, a flat uprising new, and head above the water brim doth raise the stars to view. In foggy cloud eclipsed is Apollo's dusky gleed, and Skyro's rock whom trump of fame advanced by dreary deed, Corinthus eke whom double sea on either side assail, while greatly we of grace these things do languishing bewail. The belching seas yell out the grunting rocks with all to roar. The slabby clive doth reek for whom, from whence the water ebbed before. It froths and keeping course by course, it spews the water out as does by satyr fish that flits the ocean coast about. And gulping doth the yawning throat his floods of water spout. The shaken surge did totter straight and break itself in twain. With rack more violent than we did fear, it rushed amain against the shores. Beyond the banks it breaks into the land and hideous monster follows. These for fear did quaking stand. What shape that uncouth monster had and body vast declare? A boasting bull, his marble neck, advanced high that bear, upraised his lofty bristled mane on curled forehead green, with shaggy ears pricked up by diverse speckled horns were seen, whom Bacchus erst possessed had, who tames the cattle wild, and eke the god that born in floods was bred a water child. Now puffing, he perbreaketh flames, and now as leaming light, with sparkling beams, his goggle eyes do glare and glister bright. His greasy larded neck, a mark for to be noted well, with rough and knobby kernels high out bumping big do swell. His snorting nostrils wide do grunt and yawning gulfs they was. His breast and throat bag greenishly are dawed with clammy moss. His side along begrimed is with lactus rip hue of red. On snarling knots, his wrinkled rumps toward his face he drew. His scaly haunch and lagging tail, most ugly drags he up 
as Pristis in the deep of seas, the swallowed key doth keel doth sup, or else perbreaketh out again the undigested pup. The earth did quake, the cattle feared about the field to ramp. The hunter stark with chilling fear begins to stare and stamp. The herdman had no mind his scattering heifers to pursue. The deer amazed break the pale and bade the lambs adieu. But only yet Hippolytus, devoid of fainting fear, his neighing horses with the reins of bridles hard doth fare. With wanted words, he cheereth up his nimble nags afraid. A steep highway at Argus lies with stony clives decayed. That nodding overhangs the sea, which underfleets the wet that waves. The ugly royal here heats himself and raging wrath does raise. And kindling courage hot, him forced with burning breast assays. And Chaphagist himself before gan fret with angry heart. Lo, then into the scouring course on sudden he doth start. With whirling pace, he girding forth doth scarcely touch the ground, lighting a front the trembling cart with glaring eyes he glowed. Then also doth the threatening sun with lowering brows upstart, nor changeth countenance, but speaks with stout, courageous heart. This foolish fear doth not appall my bold and hardened breast. It comes to me by kind that bulls not by me should be oppressed. His steeds defying straight the range, plunged forward with the cart, as rage did prick them, sore of fright, bestow the way they start. This bias way among the rocks they range and wander wide, but as the pilot, lest the bark should totter to one side, doth bear it even in wrestling waves, so while his horses skip, he ruleth them, now reins them hard, now with the winding whip, free lashes on their buttocks lay. His foe doth him pursue, now step by step, now meeting full against his face, he flew, provoking terror everywhere. No further fly they might. The horned beast with butting brows gan run upon them right. The trampling genets, straught of wits, do straightway break their ray. The struggling, they struggle, striving hard to slip the collar if they may. In prancing on their hinder feet, the burden hurl on ground. The sun, flat falling on his face, his body fast was bound, entangled in the winding ropes. The more he strives to loose the slipping knots, the faster sticks with sliding noose. The horses do perceive the broil, and with the wagon light, while none there is to rule the reins, with skittish fear of fright, at random out they ramping run. Even as the welkin high, the cart that missed his wanted white, disdaining in the sky, the dreary day that falsely was commit unto the sun, far off from fiery marble pole that down a skew doth run, flaying Phaeton topsy-turvy tossed, his blood begores the ground, and dinged against the rugged rocks, his head doth oft redound. The brambles rent his halid hair, the edgy flinty stones, the beauty batter of his face, and break his crashing bones. At mouth his blaring tongue hangs out, with squeezed eyne outdashed, his jaws and skull do crack, Abroad his spurting brains were pashed, his cursed beauty thus defoiled, with many wounds is spent. The jotting wheels do grind his guts, and drenched limbs they rent. At length a stake with truncheon burnt his ripped paunch hath caught, from rived grind to navel stead within his womb it wrought. The cart upon his master paused, Against the ground he crushed, the fellies stuck with, within the wounds, and out at length they rushed. So both delay and master's limbs are broke by stress of wheels. His dragging guts then trail about the wincing horse's heels. They, thumping with their horny hooves against his belly kick, from bursten paunch on heaps his bloody bowels tumble thick. There, the scatting briars upon the brakes 
with needles, pointed pricks, his gory carcass all to race with spells of thorny sticks and of his flesh, each ragged shrub a gub doth snatch and rent. His men, a morning troop God knows, with brackish tears be spent, do stray about the field, whereas Hippolytus was tore, a piteous sign is to be seen by tracing long of gore. His howling dogs their master's limbs with licking follow still. The earnest toil of woeful whites cannot the course upfill. By gathering up the gobbet sparse and broken lumps of flesh, is this the flaunting bravery that comes of beauty fresh? Who in his father's empire erst did reign as princely peer, the heir apparent to the crown and shown in honor clear, like to the gorgeous stars of heaven, his limbs in pieces small are gathered to his fatal grave and swept to funeral. O oh, nature that prevails too much, alas, how dost thou bind with bonds of blood the parent's breast? How love we thee, how love we thee by kind? Morgar our teeth and guilty eke, we would have a rest of breath, and yet lamenting with my tears, I do bewail thy death. None can lament with honesty that which he wished destroyed. The hugest heap of woes by this I think to be enjoyed, when flickering fortune's cursed wheel do cause us cry, alas, to rule the rack of things which cast we wished brought to pass. If thou, if still thou keep thy grudge, why is thy face with tears besprent? Because I slew him, not because I lost him. I repent. What heap of haps do tumble upside down the state of man? Less raging fortune flies on little things. Less learning lights are thrown by hand on Jove, hand of Jove on that which lower lies. The homely couch safe merry hearts do keep. The cottage base doth give the golden sleep. The lofty turrets top that cleans the cloud withstands the sturdy storms of southern wind and Boreas boisterous blasts with threatening loud of blustering chorus shedding showers by kind. The reeking dales do seldom noy noyance take, biding the brunt of lightning's flashing flake. The advanced crest of Caucasus, the great did quake with bolt of lofty thundering Jove, when he from clouds his thunder dinst did beat. Dame Sybil's uh, Phrygian frith, blimey, did trembling move. King Jove in haughty heaven, full sore affright the nightest, the nighest things with weapons doth he smite. The ridges low of vulgar people's house, stricken with storms, do never greatly shake. His kingdom's coast, Joe's thundering thumps to souse, with wavering wings that hour his flight doth take, nor flitting fortune with her tickle wheel lets any white assured joy to feel. Who in the world beholds the star's full bright and cheerful day forsaking ghastly death? His sorrowful return with groaning sprite he woos, sith it deprived his son of breath. He seeth his lodging in his court again, more doleful is than sharp avernus pain. O oh, Pallas, unto whom all Athens' land due homage oweth, because that Theseus thine among us worldly whites again doth stand, and seeth the heavens upon himself to shine, and passed hath, um, passeth hath the parlous miry mud of stinking Stygian fen and filthy flood, and to thy ravening uncle's dreary gale, O oh, lady chaste, not one ghost dost thou owe. The helic tyrant knows his perfect tale. Who from the court this shrieking shrill doth throw? What mischief comes in frantic Phaedra's brain, with naked sword thus running out amain? Act five, Phaedra joins Theseus and the chorus on stage. Through pierced with pangs of pensiveness, what fury pricks thy brain? What means this bloody blade? What means this shrieking out amain? And languishing upon the corpse which was thy malice made? O oh, tamer of the rustling waves, me, me do thou invade. The monstrous hags of marble seas to ramp on me send out. Whatever Thetis low doth keep with folding arms about, or what the ocean sees aloof embrace with winding wave. 
O Theseus, that to thine allies dost still thyself behave, so currishly, O thou that for thy loving friends avail, dost never yet return, thy son and father do bewail, thy passport brought by death and blood, thy stock thou dost destroy, by love or hatred of thy wife thou workest still annoy. O sweet Hippolytus, thus I behold thy battered face, and I it is, I wretch, alas, that brought thee to this case. What sinus force thy limbs so torn his snatching bowels to feel, or what procrustes racked and rent thee stretched on bed of steel, or else what minotaur of Crete, that grim twish-shaped twice-shaped bull, with horny head that daedals deems with lowing filleth full, hath thee in fitters torn, I, me, where is thy beauty fled? Where are our twinkling stars in thine eyes? Alas, and art thou dead? Appear a while, receive my words, for speak I none sh for speak I shall none ill. This hand shall strike the stroke, wherewith thy vengeance quite I will. And sith that I, I caitiff I, abridged have thy life, lo, here I am content to yield thee mine with bloody knife. If ghost may here be given for ghost, and breath may serve for breath, Hippolytus take thy take thou my soul, and come again from death. Behold, my bowels are yet safe, my limbs in lusty plight. Would God that as they serve for me, thy body serve they might. Mine eyes to render kindly light unto thy carcass dead. Lo, for thy use, this hand of mine shall pluck them from my head, and set them in these empty cells and vacant holes of thine. Why, thy wheel of me a wicked wight to win, do not repine. And if a woman's woeful heart in place of thine may rest, my bosom straight break up I shall, and tear it from my breast. But courage stout of thine doth loathe, faint woman's heart to have. Thy noble mind would rather go with manly heart to grave. Alas, be not so manly now, this manliness forbear, and rather choose to live a man with woman's sprite and fear. Then, as no man with manly heart, in darkness deep to sit, have thou thy life, give me thy death, that more deserveth it. Cannot my proffer purchase place, yet vengeance shall thou have. Hell shall not hold me from thy side, nor death of dompish grave. Sith fates will not permit thee life, though I behest thee mine, myself I shall in spite of fate my fatal twist untwine. This blade shall ride my bloody breast, myself I will despoil of soul and sin at once, through floods and tartar gulfs that boil. Through sticks and through the burning lakes I will come after thee, Thus may we please the lowering shades, receive thou here of me, the pairings of my pole, and locks cut off from forehead torn. Our hearts we could not join in one, yet wretches now forlorn. We shall together in one day our fatal hour close, if thou be loyal to, thou, to thy spouse, for him thy life then lose. But if thou uncestuous die for thy lover's sake, shall I unto my husband's bed my corpse betake, Polluted with so heinous crime, O oh, death, the chiefest joy of wounding shame, death only ease of singing love's annoy. We run to thee, embrace our souls within thy gladsome breast. Hark, Athens, hark unto my talk, and thou above the rest, thou father worse unto thy child than bloody stepdame I. False forged tales I told with shame, I feigning that did lie, which I of spite imagined when raging breast did swarve. Thou father falsely punished hast him that did not deserve. The young man chaste is cast away for mine ancestuous vice. Both bashful he and guiltless was, now play thy wanted guise. My guilty breast with bloody launce of sword deserved is riven. The dirge to the dead to purge my spouse shall with my blood be given. Thou father of the stepdame learn what things thy son should have of life deprived as to lay his carcass in a grave. O oh, wanny jaws of black avern, he tart a dungeon grim, O oh, Lethe's lake of woeful souls, the joys that therein swim, and eat ye glummy gulfs destroy, destroy me wicked wight, and still in bitter bands let me be plunged day and night. <coughs> now, now, come up ye goblin grim, from water creeks low, Whatever proteus hungry swolve aloof doth overflow, 
come douse me drowned in swallows deep the triumph in my sin and father thou that evermore full ready pressed have been to wreak mine ire adventuring i a deed deserving death with new-found slaughter have be bereft mine only son a breath his tattered limbs i scattered have the bloody field about while the innocent i punish do by chance i have found out the truth of all this wickedness heaven stars and sprites of hell i pester with my treachery that me doth overquell no mischiefs hap remaineth more three kingdoms know me well we are returned to this world but this did hell unfold his gates that burials twain i might and double death behold whereby i both a wifeless white and eke a sonless sire may with one brand to wise and son inflame the funeral fire o tamer of black-faced light alcides now restore thy booty brought from hell redeemed to me to me therefore these ghosts that now be gone a sinful wretch to death in vain i sue most undiscreet by whom these wretched, wretched, wretched whites were slain imagining destruction sore about it i will go now with thine own hands on thyself do vengeance do bestow a pine tree bow down strained perforce unto the ground below let slip into the open air shall cut my course in twain from top of skyron's rocks i will be tumbled down amain or grievous vengeance yes i have in flegerton river found tormenting guilty ghosts enclosed with fiery channel round what pit and pang shall plunge my soul already have i known that tiring toil of sisyphus that wretchless rolling stone that yield unto my guilty ghosts and being laid on these shoulders these these lifting hands of mine down let it sway and let the flitting flood about my lips deluded play yea let the ravening gripe come here and Titius paunch forsake for glutting food with grasping cleese my liver let him take increasing still to feed the fowl and for my torment's sake and pause thou my perfurious smart sire and eke the snackle wheel that whirleth still enforce my limbs thy swinging swift to feel gape thou ground and swallow me thou cruel chaos blind this passage the infernal sprites is fit for me to find my son i will ensue thou prince of ghastly ghosts in hell dread not for chaste we come to thee give me give thou me leave to dwell among thy dreadful dens for a and not to pass again alas my prayer at the gods no favor can obtain but if that mischief crave, I should, how ready would they be? O oh, Theseus, to thy plaint eternal time is granted thee. Proud thy son his obit writes, and shroud in dumpish grave his broken limbs, which monsters foul dispersed and scattered have. The shreddings of this dear beloved carcass bring to be. His mangled members hither bring on heaps that tumbled be. This is Hippolytus. I do acknowledge mine offence, but I it is that have deprived thee of life and sense. Lest that, that but once or only I should be a guilty wight. I, sire, attempting mischief, have besought my father's might. Though I enjoy my father's gift, O solitariness, a grievous plague when fearful years have brought us to distress embrace these limbs and that which yet doth of thy son remain a woeful white and bagelful breast preserve and entertain these scattered scraps of body torn o sire in order fet the straying gobbet spring again here was his right hand set his left hand here instructed will to rule the reins must be his left side ribs for well i know to be bewailed of me bitter tears as yet alas are lost and wanting still oh trembling hands behold this woeful business to fulfill and 
out with the cheeks, forbid your streams of flowing tears to run, while at the father do accompt the members of his son, and eat patch up his body rent that hath his fashion lost, disfigured foul with gory wounds, and all about be tossed. I doubt if this of thee be peace, and peace it is of thee. Here, lad, here, in the empty place, here, let it lay be, though perhaps it lie not right, I mean. Is this thy face, whose beauty twinkled as a star, and eke did purchase grace, in sight of foe procured to Ruth? Is this thy beauty lost? O cruel will of gods, O rage and sin prevailing most. Doth thus, doth thus the sire that great good turn perform unto his son, no, let thy father's last farewell within thine ears to run. Thy child, whom oft I bid farewell, the whilst the fire shall burn these bones, set ope his burial bower, and let us fall to mourn. With loud lamenting mops us wise for both the course's sake, with princely pomp his funeral fire see that ye ready make. And seek ye up the broken parts and field dispersed round, Stop up her hound hurled into a pit, let hairy clods of ground lie hard upon her cursed head. So, yes, so whilst Theseus has spent a, a fair amount of time uh, doing his Hippolytus jigsaw, uh, ready for burning, uh, the, the Phaedra, uh, who's stabbed herself uh, to death on stage, uh, just, just, just gets chucked into a pit. Um, so, yeah, I think that sort of says quite a lot uh, about the, the nature of this particular text. It has this really uh, problematic uh, uh, narrative of, uh, you know, uh, uh, calling uh, rape on... Uh, Hippolytus there and uh, and uh, uh, and the way that's used um, leading to this 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 awful situation though I have to say I did enjoy the the, the description of the dogs tearing tearing uh, into shreds I did kind of enjoy that I mean that's basically what we're here for for Seneca we're here for the lengthy descriptions of really gory hor gory horriness so I, I kind of wish you hadn't muted during that because if Ruby was still barking in the background it would have given some atmosphere yeah, that's true. I, I, we had genuine dog sound effects, you know. Yeah, um, man. I mean, yeah. I think the rest of the room sh could sh just ch chimed in, just going. Uh, okay, any final thoughts? Because we are uh, massively over time, as we tend to be with Seneca, because um, we've crammed too much text into one session. Uh, Simon, anything to throw into the room at this uh, this closing juncture? Yeah, um, I, I'd be curious to know if anyone had ever, ever heard of a performance of this in the last hundred years, uh, uh, more reading. But despite that, I actually um, had a... I've, got a strange sense of uh enjoyment out of uh, out of some of it some of the visuals i think were very good i actually love that last phaedra speech as well i think that's got a lot of potential for uh, um for a good monologue if nothing else um so yeah i um I, I probably wouldn't pay to see a production of it uh unless i brought along um a yo-yo or something but um i i kind of enjoyed hearing it at least yeah, I, I I think there is there is potential here. I mean, uh, I'm I I have seen versions of the Racine, uh, which is you know structurally not that different, you know, in terms of there's a lot of people standing on stage making long speeches, because um, mm. it does a sort of neoclassical uh, take on this. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, other takes on this are available. So I I think the the issues that it's playing with definitely resonate even if those issues are problematic and you know you can use them to sort of question those tropes that this kind of play uh, throws in and yeah I, I i again once again i'm sort of sitting here thinking right okay we've had this discussion there's a lot of text it's it's just too much to take all in in uh and and that yeah the, but with with adaptation the, the, there's there is room for maneuver um uh to play uh Bryony, any final thoughts it's just a bit crazy. Can I say that? No, sorry. Um, I don't know. Yeah. It's an interesting one. Maybe you could put it as a double bill with something that's just horrendously misogynistic. In the, I don't know. I don't know. It's, yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, misogyny hour. Let's pull it with patient Grizel. Um, uh... <laughs> Uh yeah. Uh Alan, any final thoughts? 
uh, again, too many words. Um, there's some damn good verse in there, but I'm, I'm having difficulty in seeing it as a drama. Hmm. And say so with all of these, it's, it's designed as a literary work, um, but we'll play with the edges around that and see what we get. I mean, there's, there is some, some stuff that, that I'm, I, I'm drawn to. There is, as ever, there is this overreaching uh, of, of striving too hard to make it work sometimes, uh, which I, I, I think uh, Studley seems to do quite a lot. Um, but then every so often it does click and you go, oh, no, there's some good speeches in there. And, you know, nicking the odd speech is is a very, you know, worthy thing to do sometimes. Uh, anyway, uh, that's it for this uh, this penultimate Seneca. Uh, all that remains is to thank all the wonderful readers for all their wonderful reading. Thank you very much and goodbye. Um, His goodbye. spurting brains are pashed. <laughs>